Simeon Guntrup's third class in his series of Angels, Ministers of God. He's called it Angels and the Nations. Thanks, Lincoln. Sorry about that. I was getting so enthusiastic, I just couldn't wait to get stuck in there. Good. Well, it's, it's really lovely to be with you again and uh, to have another opportunity together to discuss the scriptures. What I'd like you to do really quickly, though, is those folded bits of paper. I've got a marker pen here. Can you catch for me? Just write your name on the, mark, on the um, sheet, because I'm halfway through the week. Catch? Um, if you could do that and just pass it along the line. And I'm struggling with your name still, so I thought, look, just write only your first name or what you want me to call you. So all you have to do is, look, this becomes a little thing like that, okay? So just write, write your name on, on the, either side, and then just prop it at the front of your desk, and this will help me, and it will help the other presenters as well. Thank you. And this is the uh, actual list. I've crossed out the ones, the ones that, that aren't here. That Fine. Yep, yep. No, that's, that's great. Thank you, Bob. Do it in big letters, incidentally, so I can see you from a distance. Excellent. That's great. David. Jonathan. Katie. That's great. Savannah. Thank you. Got it. Okay. Okay. Good. Right. We're going to make a start then. So the first day... Tell me three different things about angels that we learnt from yesterday or the day before, please. One, Katie. Um, angels is like in plural? Like it was something like there is something about plural, isn't there? Yes, yes. It was the word, yeah? Elohim. It's Elohim in, in the Hebrew. And we found that often... The Elohim is referring to angels in the, pr in, in, in the plural. So when said God said, let us make man in our image, it was the angels that God used, wasn't it, to make creation. And we saw how they were involved through both Genesis, the Psalms, uh, and then Psalm 8 with the word Elohim. What else about angels have we learnt, please? Another thing. Someone from this side? Yes? They are God's, army. God's army. That's right. And we thought about the thousands and the multiple thousands that are at work. And we had the image with all those little dots around doing his work, doing his commandments, bringing about his purpose on earth. Okay. Um, one other thing about the angels. Yeah. They are his... Caught. Is that what you said? Yeah? In what sense? Similar to a king and his court. Yeah, absolutely. There's the throne. There's his court of angels ready to do his will. And we often find angels in a standing position as they're presented in scriptures, ready to just go out. And so we have angels saying, I've been sent forth, like Gabriel on one occasion. You know, I've been sent forth, and in 1 Kings, what was it? 1 Kings, come on, by memory, please. <laughs> nope. <laughs> 20. One. No. Keep going. 28. 28. No. 22. 22. We got there. 1 Kings 22. <laughs> Try and remember that. It's a really good reference. 1 Kings 22. All right. So today, we're going to progress our thoughts a little bit. Um, and think about how angels have been and are still at work amongst the nations, okay? Now, when we look, you know, at your country, are you all from the, the U.S. apart from us three? Yeah, pretty much, yeah, so you know all about President Trump and, uh, and such like, yeah. Uh, and, and we've got things happening back in the U.K., with, have, you, have you heard of something called Brexit? Yeah. yeah, okay. So Brexit, and we're all in a muddle at the moment, just wondering whether we're going to stay with Europe or leave Europe. And prophecy would suggest, do you know which way prophecy suggests we should go? Yeah, Jonathan? Yeah, to, to leave. 
So prophecy, we believe, indicates that England and the UK, apart from Southern Ireland, needs to leave Europe as a block. What's one good argument from the scriptures that you may have heard at your own ecclesias to say that's how it's got to be prophetically? Does anyone know why we, why we tend to believe that we've got to come out of Europe? Has anyone looked at or heard a talk on Ezekiel 38? Yeah? There seems to be a, a northern confederacy in power, and there's a th southern power as well that challenges them. And it's called the power of Tarshish. And so we believe we're part of that southern power, and part of the northern power is Europe. You know, Russia and Europe together. So we can't be the same. So we'll see. But my point, my dear young people, is that the angels are at work and they will bring God's will about. So there's a reason, whether we know it or not, or like it or not, there's a reason why Mr. Trump is your president at the moment. There is a reason why we're all in this turmoil with Brexit in the UK. There is a reason why Vladimir Putin is the president of Russia at the moment. There's a reason why Netanyahu is the Prime Minister of Israel, and so on and so on and so on. What I'm trying to impress upon you is the world that we see it isn't just by accident. God and his angels are at work. And that's what we're going to think about today through the prophecy of Daniel, particularly. Okay, so... Uh, we'll look at Daniel as a, a bit of a case study in seeing how God sets up rulers and takes away rulers. Now, he doesn't do it just by, you know, zapping people, as it were, and suddenly they appear and they're there. It doesn't work like that with God. God uses his angels to bring about circumstances, sometimes years, sometimes hundreds of years before the person might appear. God is at work amongst people amongst nations, so that the right man or the right woman at the right time in history comes along and, whether they know it or not, perform God's will, perform God's purpose. Okay. So what I'd like us to do is do a bit of a word study. So we're going to do some Bible study together. Okay. Now, you already told me yesterday, looking for my little pointer, you already told me yesterday that the Old Testament is written in what? Hebrew. And the New Testament in, yeah, Katie? Greek, yeah, good. Now, what happens with um, translation work? You all right? Oh, sorry, I've got mine now. Sorry. <laughs> Um, what happens um, with translation in the Hebrew, for example, because that's what we're going to be looking at, is the translators look at the word and they say, well, what's the best English word we could translate that into so that English readers can read it? And the amazing thing, the interesting thing about Hebrew and Greek to some degree is that it's very hard to always translate exactly the same word for word because the Hebrew has certain colors that it covers. And so sometimes we need to select a small selection of English words that come up with that same idea and that reflect faithfully what the Hebrew word is, if you see what I mean. So that means when we read scripture, sometimes it's really, really helpful to get back to the original word that God wrote it in and not just read it in the English, though, of course, you know, that's fine, that's good, of course it is. But sometimes we need to go a little bit further, look at a concordance, a Bible concordance, and see what the English word is. Sorry, see what the Hebrew word is. Now, the word removeth. Okay, um, come to Daniel. Let's go to Daniel, please. All, all turn over to Daniel. Wonderful prophecy. You, you, you all know the, the basic message of chapter 2, I'm sure you do, with the image. Uh, and so on and so forth. Come to Daniel 2. 
you know, and the image that uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw in the dream. Who can tell me the empires? Come on, let's just get that out of the way. Let's deal with it quickly. Who was the head of gold? Yeah. Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar. Who was the chest and arms? Someone over the side. What empire? Yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, Persia. That's right. And the Medo-Persian, wasn't it? Uh, What was the belly and thighs? The Greek empire. Legs of iron. What was someone else, Jonathan? Someone else? Legs of iron, come on, who is it? Iron. Someone from the back row? Someone from the front row? Other than Jonathan. Right, okay. Go then, John. It is Rome, yeah, iron Rome, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, we end up with the, the feet, don't we, of mixed with iron and clay, which don't really mix. And that's the nations we've got today. And it was all destroyed by the stone, which represents what? Someone over here? The return of Jesus Christ, yeah. The stone, that's right, that was sent by God, cut out without hands, to destroy man's empire. You see, if you think about it, the image... It was just ready to topple, wasn't it? I mean, if no one, I was just talking about construction to uh, Lincoln before we started, no one would ever build a skyscraper or a building where all the weight is at the top. But that's how Nebuchadnezzar's image was, with gold at the top. It's just ready to topple, isn't it? Everyone puts the weight at the bottom to support something. So here we are in Daniel 2. Look at verse 20 and 21, please. Can I have a reader? 20 and 21. Thank you. When you're ready. Which chapter? Daniel 2, 20 and 21. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changed the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. Right. Okay, thank you very much for that reading. And we read these scriptures, don't we? And we think, yeah, okay, I get that. God removeth kings and setteth up kings. My question is, how? Okay. How does God actually remove kings? Because it's not as if, you know, you see one of our prime ministers or presidents suddenly there and suddenly gone. It doesn't work like that. And likewise, setting up. You know, we see all the elections and, and, and all the rest that happens around it. This is God's angels working in the background. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? If, 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 you, could, if you imagined it on, on, on a stage and you see the main actors, there's a whole cast of people um, with the production... Uh, sending people on and taking people off the, the, the stage, etc., to bring what we, what we see at the front. There's a whole raft of people behind the scenes. It's a bit like that, that God with his angels is behind the scenes of all that we see going on in the world, the setting up of kings and princes and so on and so forth. So when it says God removeth kings uh, and setteth up kings, he's doing that through his angels. So, just look at 327 then. And this is a key theme. So it's worth either making a note, underlining, doing a cross-reference um, in, in your Bible, if, if that's the way you take notes, that's fine. That all these words are from the same Hebrew word. It's the same Hebrew word. So in 327, we read... The princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counsellors being gathered together, saw these wise men upon whose bodies fire had no power, nor was hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had actually passed on them. It's interesting, isn't it? Had removed from them. So God actually looked after those um, in the fire at this time. Look at 431. Again, the same word. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is 
departed from you. So the prophet from God could say, do you know what, Nebuchadnezzar? The kingdom's departed from you. Okay? And the way that the kingdom was going to be departed was through angelic work. Because they were manipulating and maneuvering and bringing about circumstances by which other armies would come along and overtake Nebuchadnezzar's um, kingdom. So could I have a read, four readers for 5 verse 20, 7 verse 12, 7 verse 26, and 7 verse... Um, well, no, leave verse 14 at the moment. So 520, 712, and 726. Yeah? Okay, could the mic just come wherever it is? Over to the front row here. You can just run along. And Bob, if you just do the third one for me, just so we can just go along there. Is that all right? Mm? So yours will be 726. If we start with David. Yeah? Um, it's verse 5, verse 20. Yeah, and then 726. Fantastic. To start with David, this end. It's David, isn't it? But when his heart was lifted up and his mind was hardened, in pride he was disposed and the, from his kingly throne, and they took the, his glory from him. Right. So they took. Okay, go on then, John. <coughs> As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Thank you. And 26. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Great. Thank you. Thanks for those readings. Fantastic. So in all of those, the Hebrew is exactly the same. It's just translated slightly different. But all the common theme is that these kingdoms, these kings, they'll pass away, they'll be removed, whatever English it says there, it's the same Hebrew word. And, and we've just got to get used to the idea that God is doing that through his angels. So 7 and verse 14, um, I'll read this one. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So that's the opposite. So we've got all these kingdoms of men represented by Nebuchadnezzar's image, and in chapter 7 represented by the beasts, they're all under God's hand through the angels, going to be taken away and removed, and other empires will come along and take them over. But, verse 14, the scriptures tell us there's going to be one kingdom, same word, that will not pass away. There we are. In, um, okay. That will not pass away. And that's going to be, you know, the, the times that Revelation, the book of Revelation, take us to. So the angels are at work in all the nations, causing them one by one to fall, you know, and new kings to take over, and new presidents and prime ministers to take on, and it's all in God's hands until there comes one that will never pass away. Okay. Now, we're just going to do this, a very similar exercise with another word. Okay, so what we're doing is called a word study in the Bible. And as you grow up, hopefully, you know, in the meeting and in the truth and in your own meetings, wherever that is, it's a really good way of studying the Bible sometimes. You come across a word and you think, I wonder how else that's translated or I wonder where else that word comes. And sometimes we can learn really important things by just following a word through. And that's all we're doing here. It's not complicated. It's just following a word through. Okay, so come to 2 verse 39. Daniel 2 verse 39. Um, now, God says to Nebuchadnezzar in 38... Um, 
And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, shall he be given unto thine hand, and hath made thee ruler, talking about Nebuchadnezzar, over them all. Thou art this head of gold, he says. And after thee shall arise another kingdom, inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule. Now we're going to pick up on that word arise. Okay, every word's important, remember? This term, verbal inspiration, every word in the original is important. So we talked about God removing kings, getting kings and empires out of the way. Now we're going to think about the same, but how God causes new ones to come on the scene. All right? So here's some references for us. And he setteth up. Kings. Do you remember back in 2 and verse 21? He removeth kings and setteth up kings. So we just simply look in Daniel and say, where else does the Hebrew word for setteth up come? And it's interesting. So if you want to make a note of these, and then we'll just um, go through and read, read around. Perhaps we'll, in a moment we'll have the mic this side and we can just do a verse each in a moment, Lincoln, thank you. And after these shall arise another kingdom. Shall the God of heaven set up, same word, a kingdom. And setteth up over the base. God's in control, you see, of all our kingdoms. God's in control through his angels. God ruled in the kingdom of men and that he appointeth, same word. And the words stand in chapter 7 there and arise Okay, I'll let you just jot those down, and then, uh, then we'll just read round. Okay. All right, so Lincoln, can we have the mic over this side? Um, perhaps, could we start at the back with Emily? Would you mind? Um, and just, just put one verse each, that's all, and just pass the mic along the back row if you wouldn't mind, and then we'll come around to the front row if that's, that's all right, depending on how many you get to. So just um, 239, then 244, and, and so on. But, but just try, as we're reading round, just remember these key words, and why we're reading them is to get a slightly broader context so we understand how God is using that word. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Great, thanks. So 244. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another per people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Lovely, thank you. And 417. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the bas basest of men. That's right, setteth up there. Again, it's God and the angels that are setting up this person. So, 521. He was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys he was fed grass like his, an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the most high God was the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will thank you very much great 7-4 uh, 
first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Great. So we're seeing the imagery now of the beasts which represent nations stand up. It's God's doing that nations should stand upon uh, their feet, as it were. Yeah, thank you. Jacob. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Great. <laughs> so just come forward to Joseph. Yeah. Um, so, yep, again, these, these beasts, it says there in 717, isn't it, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. It's not by accident. It's through angelic ministration. So 424. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Great. Thank you all very much for those readings. So once again, my point is, we've thought about how God removes kings. This is about, in Daniel, how God sets up kings. Okay? To arise, to stand, to set up, to, um, yeah common words, all from the same Hebrew word. So through the prophecy of Daniel, what we're really being told, my dear young people, is it's no accident <laughs> that it all started with Nebuchadnezzar, you know, the head of God. It's no accident that the Persians and Medes came along. It's all under control. God, God caused it. God arranged it. God allowed them to defeat the Babylonians. And it's no accident that the Persians were taken over. Who was the key guy who uh, led the um, Greek Empire? Who was the first notable man that led? Yes, please. Alexander. Alexander the Great, that's right, yeah. And he was known for his speed of operation and his armies. He just motored through the Middle East like no one's business. In fact, that comes through in, in the prophetic word, how fast he was running along, um, overtaking. And then, of course, it was no accident that uh, the Roman Empire then took over from the Greeks. So my point for our studies this week is that it was the angels at work. Come to Proverbs. Let's have a change. Proverbs chapter 20. So what I've been saying is, is summed up really nicely uh, in this verse. So if you want to take a, a verse away, sort of summing up what we've been looking at so far, here's a good one. Proverbs 20 and verse 24. Where's the mic? Over here. Let's just, thank you very much. Can I start at this end, at the front, Carol, if you wouldn't mind. Thanks so much. Uh, verse 24 of Proverbs 20. Man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? Great, thank you. What is that telling us? What is that actually saying to us? Rephrase it in your own words. What, what are we being told here? Any thoughts? Any ideas? Yeah, Joseph. Right, okay. Yep. That man, yeah, man's goings are actually of the Lord, of Yahweh. You know, we might think we're in control. President Trump might think he's in control. Vladimir Putin might think he's in control. Theresa May might think she's in control. But there are bigger things controlling them. They don't know it. But that's the way it is. Man's goings actually are of the Lord. How can a man, it says, then understand his own way? 
God has given us free will, so we get on with life, you know, as best as we can, and so on and so forth. But actually, God is at work all the time behind the scenes. And that's, that's an amazing thing. It's actually um, quite a challenging thing at one level, but it's also a comforting thing. So there was a time when I was trying to keep up with what's happening with Brexit, for example. You know, there's so many changes, and you look at the news, and you think, oh, how does that fit with prophecy and, and such like. But actually, we can rest assured that God is in control, thankfully, and that it will turn out all right. Um, so look at verse 1 of chapter 21. Um, Katie, could you just read that for us, please? Verse 1 of chapter 21. Proverbs, that is. The king's heart is in the, <clears throat> in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it wheresoever he will. Great, thank you. So what we're being asked to think um, now is, is just like, um, you know, king's heart is, is like the rivers of water. And if, if we've got a, you know, a river goes this way and that way. God is saying in the scriptures, the king's heart, actually God is through circumstance, through experience, through manipulation, through, through things that happen, is actually in control of the king's heart. Just, just like a moving river that moves this way and that way. God is in control of their hearts. Okay, um, let's just look at Daniel 9, fantastic prophecy, while we're looking at a case study of Daniel. Daniel 9. Has anyone heard about the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel? Heard about it? Yep. Where does it end? What's, what's, can you tell me anything about it? Katie or Natalie? You've heard about it, which is great. So 70 weeks suggests a time period, doesn't that? And there's a great prophecy here in chapter 9, and it's known you know, generally by the, the, the 70 weeks prophecy. Um, the wonderful thing about it is it demonstrates again that God has got things in control. So just look with me at verse 18. All right, Daniel. I'll, I'll read these few verses and then I'll come back to you later. Oh my God, incline thine ear... Open thine eyes and behold our desolations, right? And the city which is called by thy name, for we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God. For thy city and thy people are called by thy name. So Daniel is praying for his people and for his city that have been destroyed, basically, by the Babylonians. And whilst I was speaking and praying, note this really carefully, this is our subject now. While, I was, while Daniel was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Right? Gabriel. An angel was sent to Daniel. And Gabriel revealed to Daniel the 70-week prophecy which ended where? Those that have... Katie, do you know where the 70... You said you knew about it. Do you know where it ends? Okay. Anyone else? It ends with Christ. 
in around AD 29, 30, 31, okay? With Christ and his crucifixion. And it goes up actually just a little bit beyond that to the preaching to the Gentiles. We're not going to look at it in detail, but it's marvelous because God's answer is wrapped up in what Gabriel comes and presents down. He says, don't worry, God's got it under control. There's a time that we can look to in a period of time, the 70 weeks prophecy, when a Savior will appear, when the things of God will be restored through a Son, through Jesus Christ. Now, I'd like you to do a little bit of research. We've got, um, you've got a few minutes. I want you to try and find Gabriel at the birth of Jesus. Just have a look in your margins. Do a little bit of research. I don't mind you talking to your next door neighbor. If you've got a concordance in the back of your Bible, look at the back of your Bible. That's absolutely fine. Just find out where Gabriel is mentioned in the New Testament for me. Okay, just do your best. It's pretty amazing. Because <laughs> Daniel was written, I don't know, something like 500 years BC. All right? Just see if you can find where Gabriel is in the New Testament. This angel, Gabriel. Got it. Great. Thank you. Okay, so um, what, what, what reference have you come up with? Thank you. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Is, did others get that? Yeah, Luke 1. Great. Well done. Thank you, Hannah. Is that right? Yes, good. I'm getting there slowly. Um, so Luke chapter 1. Now, of course, what is Luke chapter 1 largely about? particularly the, the, the second half. What's it all about? What's the subject matter of Luke 1 in the context of Gabriel? Any ideas? What's the context, Hannah, behind what's, what's going on there with Gabriel? Right, okay. And, and, and Jesus, I think, as well. Yeah. Good. Okay, so just come to Luke 1 then. Um, so, verse 26. Let's just join it in verse 26 here. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, angel Gabriel note, was sent from God. Now, this is the same angel that was there in Daniel's day. And it's to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. The 70 weeks prophecy was saying, look forward, there will be a day when your questions, Daniel, will be answered through the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's Gabriel again with the Lord Je about the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel, that's Gabriel, came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled 
at his saying and cast in our mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel, Gabriel again, said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. Now isn't that marvelous? Here was Daniel 500 years earlier saying, what's all this coming to? What about thy city? What about Jerusalem? What about your people, God? And he was praying. And while he was praying, this angel, Gabriel, came to him and said, and revealed the 70 weeks prophecy, which was dealing by Jesus. And then, all that time later, in the New Testament, there's Gabriel announcing to Mary, you're going to have this child. So here's a 500-year-old angel. You see, they don't age like us. <laughs> they were outside time. And we do get special angels, special named angels in the Bible that do God's work and do God's business. Okay, so there are the thousands and thousands, but there are some specially named ones. There's one other specially named angel. Does anyone know what it, who, who, who it is? Yeah? Michael. So let's just quickly go back to Daniel. We've just got quick... We, we can uh, just fit this in before we break up for lunch. Okay, come to Jack Daniel 10. There, there is um, an, another angel which um, we believe named, was named as well. And it seems as though these, these specially named angels have particular functions. So Gabriel we often find in the context of Jesus Christ. So please remember that, that Gabriel is an angel particularly connected with Jesus Christ. Okay. Now Michael, let's just look at the, uh, chapter 10 and verse 5, and we'll just build up a little picture here. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded. So it's a bit of a vision, he saw this man clothed in linen, verse 11. And he said, this certain man that is, O oh, Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Okay. Um, and said, Fear not, Daniel, verse 12, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. And note, I am come for thy words. Come from before the Lord, as it were, the throne. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Right? Now, here we go. But lo, so, so, what we're presented with is a very interesting picture that there was an angel at work in Persia, right, working with the Persian king, etc., making things happen, but he was struggling to make things happen um, at the right time, as it were, and so, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, another angel called Michael, a chief, came to help me, and I remained there with the king's of Persia. Okay, now just glance over to verse 19. Uh, and I said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. When he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, uh, for thou hast strengthened me. Um, and let's just skip to verse 21. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Okay, Michael, the archangel. Now it seems, when we, I've got two more references that I'll, I'll show you. Okay, it seems that Michael is particularly involved with things of Israel. So we believe that Michael is the angel that led Israel through the wilderness. Before we leave Daniel, just look at chapter 12 and verse 1. This is a prophecy of the latter days, of our days, my dear young people. And we can see Israel has returned to their land. Yeah, 1948, the state of Israel was declared again and so on. Uh, 
Uh, verse 1 of chapter 12, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great note, prince. And there should be a time of trouble, etc., etc. So he's called Michael the Prince again. That's chapter 8, chapter 12, sorry, chapter 10, chapter 12. And one other place, right back in Joshua. Let me show you this. I think it's Joshua 5. So when we look at Michael through the scriptures, I repeat, it's often in association with Israel and Israel coming back to the land. Okay, so look at Joshua 5 and verse 14. And he said, so, so, well, no, look at 13. So this is Joshua, bringing children of Israel into the land again, lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. Joshua went to him. And said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay. Note, but as the captain of the host, looked at that, haven't we, about the host, of the Lord I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? So I believe that this was the angel Michael, the archangel Michael as well. Look in the margin of the word captain. What have you got? Has anyone got anything in the margin there for the word captain? An alternative word? I've got the word prince. It's the word prince. It's the same. The archangel, Michael, the prince. It's how he's described in chapter 10 of Daniel. This is how he's described in chapter 12 of Daniel. And I believe... Uh, this is the same one, and it's involved with Israel. So what have, we, what have we seen today, briefly, just summing up and closing? We've seen, we've used Daniel really as a, as a case study to show that it's God that is in control of the kings, the leaders, the rulers of this world. He sets them up and he removes them through his work. Oh, I was going to show you a chiastic structure there. Um, We'll see. I might look at that tomorrow. We haven't got time today. Um, yeah. So we've seen how God and his, the angels are at work. And we've seen how that God is in control, actually, of individuals as well as nations. And that two key angels are named in the, script, in, in the scriptures. Gabriel who is involved with events around the Lord Jesus Christ, and Michael, the archangel, who is involved with events concerning God's people Israel. So if you can just remember that and take it away with you, those simple uh, points, uh, that would be great. So I'm going to close there. Might pick up on some of these things uh, tomorrow, we'll see. Okay.